We are all familiar with the way aeroplanes ascend. After a brisk one-way drive, where the plane generates enough lift to overcome gravity and take to the skies. But in the midst of war, or a crucial search and rescue mission, you don't always have a choice or a one way for the typical takeoff, which creates the need for an alternative. The solution to this? Vertical takeoff and landing, or VTOL for short. One of the very first attempts to make this solution a reality came from Rolls Royce with the thrust measuring rig more commonly known as the Flying Bedstead. The first two were produced in 1953 as a frame with four legs barely resembling an aircraft. Unfortunately, it was not the safest of aircrafts and over the course of its testing, two pilots would lose their life. The inherent lack of stability stemming from its box-like design containing downward facing exhausts and reaction jets on its arms to attempt to aid maneuverability made them incredibly difficult to control. The bedstead proved VTOL was a viable concept and prompted work to begin on a new VTOL aircraft that had vaster capabilities. In 1941, the concept for a new engine known as a lift jet was created, designed to be compact and generate much larger amounts of thrust than the flying bedstead. With the development of this engine, funding was provided for the development of a new VTOL dubbed the SC-1. These aircrafts featured auto stabilization, allowing it to stay upright, significantly improving the safety of the pilot. Despite this, one pilot lost their life during the tests. The SC-1 program was considered a success, completing many tethered and untethered flights. Despite not having operational capabilities, these tests revealed key areas for development within VTOL aviation. Sydney Cam of Hawker Aircrafts, unimpressed by the existing lifter engines, was informed of Bristol Sidley's engine tinkering. The BE.53 Pegasus, Ralph Hooper and John Fuzzard were behind sketches of a new VTOL named the P1127, the renamed to the Kestrel. Despite the Defence Ministers expressing no need for a new combat aircraft, Hawker and Bristol persisted tinkering with various designs, including the P1132, but it wouldn't be until 1960 that the first P1127 would be begin to put together, leading to its first tethered and untethered fight later that year. It also took part in sea trials on carrier HMS Ark Royal in 1963, breaking ground for naval VTOL usage. The UK government moved forward with a variant which evolved into the P1127 RAF, which would later become the Harrier GR. The initial flight of the Harrier GR1 was in August 1966, the first actual production Harrier was flown in December 1967, and exactly a year later, it would embark on the start of its military journey. The GR1 was much more refined and developed version of the P1127. The engine lasted much longer, with the older Pegasus engine lasting 50 hours, whilst the new one could last 300 hours. The wings were brand new and much more streamlined to improve performance of the Harrier. Many other variants of the Harrier were developed, with one of those being the Sea Harriers. Sea Harriers were utilised on aircraft carriers to help allow more jets to be stationed on the carriers, as less space was needed for takeoff. Harriers also found themselves involved in the Falklands War. RAF Harriers were able to help with ground attacks with the knowledge that they had protection of the Sea Harriers. While the Harrier 1 proved itself in combat, especially in the Falklands, the Americans wanted more and found that the Harrier 1, or as they would call it, the AV-8A, lacks in range and payload, being less than half at the A4 Skyhawk a light aircraft developed for the US military by Douglas Aircraft Company in 1954, being almost two decades older. To address this issue, the American McDonnell Douglas and the British Hawker Sidley began a joint development of the Harrier II in 1973. By December that year, the group completed a project document defining an advanced Harrier powered by the Pegasus 15 engine, with the aim of doubling its range and payload of the Harrier, unofficially nicknamed the AV-16. In 1975, Britain and Hawker Sidley pulled out of the project, owing to increased spending, decreased budget, and the RAF's insignificant 60-plane requirement. Now with the Americans all alone, and development costs estimated to be around £1.5 billion, translated into modern-day currency, they decided to pull the plug on the project. However, the project continued in 1980, with Britain back in the American program yet again, and by 1983, Britain became fully involved, making it a joint UK-US programme. The Harrier II, or the GR5, was the anglicised version of the AV-8B, with many differences, with examples being the avionic fit, the wing design, 
and some of the armaments. The Harrier's journey from early VTOL experimentation to its iconic role in military history reflects the resilience of innovative aircraft design. The Harrier II, a testament to transatlantic collaboration, remains a symbol of adaptability and success in the realm of vertical takeoff and landing aircraft.